everybody. I think it's time to, to start, right? And um, starting a new session, this will be about hierarchies, and our first speaker is uh, Enric Olson from uh, Vienna and Santa Fe. Double. I have my own. <laughs> <laughs> can do double, stereo. <laughs> okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so we as humans, we have a remarkable ability to adapt to our world. And uh, we can effortlessly change our network connections, the way we integrate the information in order to solve the problems we're facing. So uh, this is a complex puzzle with lots of moving parts, lots of interacting parts. But today I'm going to focus on one specific part of this big, big, big puzzle. Uh, and that is... Um, the subjective perceptions of the social world. I mean, even if you can measure objective properties of the external world, in the end, what matters is what information is available to us and how it's filtered through our cognitive system. Uh, and what I'm going to do today is to try to connect uh, the broader literature and the work that I've been doing uh, about how people uh, make judgments about broader populations to the research on, on perceptions of inequality. So the last, let me say, 15 years or so, there's been a remarkable kind of uptick in, in research about perceptions of inequality. Um, and actually, these indicators of, of, uh, of uh, perceptions of inequality sometimes are better predictors of uh, policy attitudes, public health metrics, and overall well-being than other objective measures. But in this literature, what stands out most when you read it, and you also see it in lots of, of uh, reviews of this literature, is that there are lots and lots and lots of conflicting results here. Do people underestimate uh, inequality? Lots and lots of studies showing that. Do they overestimate inequality? Lots and lots and lots of studies showing that also. So <laughs> what is going on here? Like, what, what is this? Um, uh, so here is one example. <clears throat> so this is uh, uh, two studies uh, published uh, in 2014 and 2016 by uh, Chambers et al. and Page and Goldstein. So here they use actually the same kind of, kind of the same measure. So they asked uh, people about uh, so what is the percentage of uh, uh, people uh, that have the annual income in the U.S. under 35,000, between 35,000 and 75,000, and so on and so forth? Um, and Page and Goldstein uh, also asked this, but a little bit more sophisticated with more, uh, more categories and so on and so forth. But what we see here now to the left, the chamber study, is that if you look at the uh, lowest income category, there's an overestimate. And there's an underestimation of the highest income category. Okay, so what about Page and Goldstein? Well, not surprisingly, I'm going to show you conflicting results. <laughs> so we have the opposite here. We have the underestimation of the lowest income category, and we have overestimation of the highest income category. So how can this be? There's pretty much a similar measure, similar things, but we still get very, very different results. And this goes through all and all and all of this literature of, of uh, subjective perceptions using different measures. And I say different measures, and that's one of the things that, uh, that also kind of stands out in this literature, is that there are so many different measures. And this has been, of course, in uh, people discussing this, like, God, we have so many different measures. What, what should we do? So, for example, <coughs> we have three different types of measures being used a lot in international service and so on. We have these distributional measures. We ask about distributions directly. Uh, we also have uh, ratio measures. So you take uh, questions such as, how much do you think the chairman of a large natural corporation earns? And then you also ask, how much do you think an unskilled worker in a factory earns? And you take the ratio of those two and you correlate it with different things. Uh, another thing that, okay, people uh, that do this research, oh, but mm, people might not be so good in actual numbers, so let's do pictures instead, distributional pictures. So here is more like an ordinal measure where people have to match different shapes of distribution to what they think their country, uh, country's distribution of income is. That's also a measure that's used a lot in lots of uh, different international surveys. Okay, 
But there are also other problems here that have been pointed out in the literature. It's like, exactly what are we asking about here? So sometimes in, 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 when you summarize this literature, you say that, oh, underestimation, overestimation, but of what? Is it annual income? Is it house of wealth? Is it before and after taxes? This and that. There's lots of different ways, different wealth measures that we used also. Uh, all these things that we'll come back to and discuss all these different measures and uh, the actual measures for wealth. <clears throat> so, how can people do this? Uh, how can people make judgments of broader populations? Well, obvious first thing is that you just recall what, what is in the distribution. You know it. That seems <laughs> less likely because most people don't know. They need to make some inference about this, uh, uh, what the distribution is and how much uh, different people, uh, people's incomes are. Other things that's also been used in the literature, like, okay, let's not have a model, we have some uniform prior, maybe updated with something and something like that, that might also be something. And of course, all of this can be then kind of colored by your political preferences and other beliefs that kind of bias your judgments there and there and so forth. But what I want to focus on today uh, is something that has been in focus actually in the last few years in literature on perception and inequality. And that is the characteristics of your immediate social environment. And uh, it's been shown now in actually quite a lot of studies that, that people's perception of inequality uh, and other population estimates actually is influenced by the immediate social environment. And that can be done in different ways. So, for example, in this article in Dortre et al., they, they took the actual income in, in the zip code where their participants were located, and so how that related to their uh, uh, distributional preferences, but also, in their case, the, uh, their different preference for uh, redistributional policies. But we have, what we have done in, in our studies is that we use perceived wealth. So what we do is actually we ask people, like, in your social circle, where the social circle is defined as as uh, people you have been in contact with, your friends, your family, and so on. And we ask them, like, okay, what percentage of people in your social circle are, are uh, having an income that is less than 25,000, and so on and so forth. So we get the distribution of judgment of that. And then we use that as a basis for our uh, models of how you use that information to make judgments of broader populations. Um, so the main idea here is then, like, the population estimates are based on perceived characteristics from people's social circles. Okay, there are lots of things to unpack here. So what about these social circles? How do they look? Can people actually do these judgments? So how accurate are they? So here are examples of individual social circle estimates. So this on the left here are six different participants that are located on different uh, places uh, in the distribution themselves. And they make these social circle estimates. And we see here now for three different uh, distributions, household wealth, work stress, and number of friends, because we're interested in, in a model that can explain distributional judgments or, or of, of characteristics in, for many different target kind of variables. And we see here that, uh, let's see if I can manage this. Oh yeah, it works. Whoa, this is difficult. Okay. <laughs> uh, so for example here, we have uh, these participants, it's located uh, at the lower end there, at one. But up here, <laughs> uh, one. you see that the social circle estimate is like, okay, it's like mm, mostly in the bottom part here, and it like, tapers off here. And then if you look down to uh, this one, the better off, as, as mostly of, uh, estimated the social circle is mostly uh, where that person is located in the, in the distribution, which is then, well, to us it's pretty obvious. I mean, we, we interact with people that are similar to us, we live in neighborhoods that uh, have similar wealth and so on and so forth as well. But we also see that it's not always the case. I mean, for example, this participant is actually here up here at six. But it seems that, that participant uh, in this particular study has actually a social circle that's located way lower than others. So we get this also a variation of this social circle estimate. Okay, so they can actually make social circle estimates because one one criticism could be that, oh, they just report there where they are in the distribution, just a peak on where they are, but they can actually do this. Okay. Are, the, are these estimates accurate then? Well, we have some, first some indirect uh, evidence that these are actually accurate. 
So this is results from a study in the Netherlands, a national representative survey, where we asked people about house of wealth, number of friends, work stress, and so on. Um, different types of, of distributions. Uh, and we see if we take the average of this social circle estimate, they are quite remarkably um, corresponding to the population census for these different variables. So that's at least an indirect evidence that uh, there is something there in the social circle that's actually accurate. Okay, but now you're thinking, but the population estimates are biased. How can that be? <laughs> but before I go, go into that, I can also say that, that we have um, used other indirect indicators that show that, that uh, these uh, social circle estimates are actually accurate. So we have used these social circle questions in uh, predicting, forecasting elections. And um, what we do then is basically ask people, okay, in your social circle define this. People you're interacted uh, with in the last 30 days that can vote. Uh, what percentage do you think will vote for Trump? Which percentage do you think will vote for Biden and others? And we show here that this social circle question can outperform the traditional question of asking us who will you vote for in six different national elections uh, across four different countries. And we see here in the picture here in the figure, uh, the absolute error for own intentions, this is a traditional question, and social circle question, that the average error, the error here is lower for the social circle across the three. And then we see that same pattern across all these different elections, which is a further indication that, that social circle estimates actually uh, capture something that's real in your social circle. So there's a, how can this be, well, why? Why is it the case that this outperformed the, the own intention? Well, one is simply a kind of a, a wisdom of crowds effect, because basically what we're doing here, you ask one person, but it gives estimate of, of uh, what other people work. So basically you increase the sample size. If this is accurate representations of, of how people in a social circle will vote, then this will actually kind of increase sample size and also uh, um, increase the accuracy. But maybe most more importantly is that, that this um, way of asking can, can uh, reach uh, populations that you don't reach by, by other uh, surveys. So it could be that many people that they don't answer it, but by asking someone else that know that person, you can get an estimate of what that person would have answered. So that's also a, a contributing factor to, to why this works. Okay, back to the question that I was. So how can it be that that the population estimates are still biased if they base their, their judgments on the social circles. Yes. yes. What do you mean by estimate of all intentions? And oh, that's just, oh yeah, uh, so, sorry. That's just, what will you vote for? So, um, and when you say uh, it seems uh, correct or not, correctly predicted or not, what do you mean by that? Uh, you mean in the election? Mm. of how their social circle will perform vis-a-vis mm. um, -vis what um, actually, uh, how their social circle act actually performs, right? And um, they uh, so what you're saying is that they estimated how their social circle will vote fairly accurately. Yeah. Now, what is the corresponding thing for own intentions? Uh, how do you, uh, what is the difference between uh, Estimation and actual performance. So, uh, so the performance. Uh, I mean, the question is just okay. What are the que so? Let's take the the. If you just take the election, uh, if we go back here. So here there are three types of questions. One question is, what will you vote for in the election? That's the own intention question. The other question is a social circle question. What percentage in your social circle do you think will vote for Biden, Trump, and so on and so forth? And then we actually have a pop, so in this case, you see here the election winner. We have another question here also, it's called election winner. Then we ask uh, um, basically who will win the, uh, this is a population question, the election winner. What percentage, uh, who do you think will win the election? Which is basically the estimate of the population, what the population will do. So these are the three questions we have here. Yes, 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 of course. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is all, all, this is a forecast of the election results, like the standard 
forecast and election results, we can, so we compare that to the actual, the actual percentages that Trump, Biden, and other got. Just by averaging the social circle estimate, by taking the average of the, all the, uh, what you think that, what would you will vote, and also average of, okay, uh, who will win the election. And, and all that we, we showed. But, but the idea here then, when we go further, here is that now, we come to the second step, is that we actually use this information from our social circles to make these population estimates. And that is the, then this is, so, so how, how can we go from, uh, how do people use this information in order to make population estimates? What? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes. Yeah, so, so this, so uh, typically in this uh, uh, election studies, you have several waves before the election. So wave one is further away from the election than wave three. Wave three here is always like just before the election, while this other waves are several weeks or several months before the, the election. Okay. And that, what are the information you use at your session to define uh, these or forecasts? Yes. So, so, so yeah. Circles. Okay. So more specifically, uh, we usually use a, a definition. I mean, this is also up for the debate exactly how one can do this. But we, we say that uh, uh, we, we tell them that uh, um, you are now going to, to estimate the percentages of different things. Uh, in your social circle or your social, we call them social contacts because more easily for people to understand that. And we define that uh, usually as uh, those um, that are your friends, family or acquaintances that you have interacted with frequently in the last 30 days. That's our, our that's a standard thing that we use. And then in addition, in this election studies, we also need to have some uh, things. They need to be over 18 and eligible for voting and so on. So we, we take it down to that thing. So that, that's our usual definition that we use throughout our different studies. Of course, so this is not just a random sample of the most of the network. Uh, well, if you suppose there is a social network. Yeah. Study, so this is not a random sample of the most of the network. No, it's not it's a, a random. It's a, it's a biasing sample. As, it, yes, it could be. But then if you have a national representative sample, then you are sampled in a representative way, and then you can give information about others that are like you or not really like you. So, so it's, it's, it becomes more, more <laughs> maybe more like a, a, a two-step, uh, uh, not snowball sample, but almost yeah. like that. Just, just one simple thing is that uh, if you look at the typical number of friends yeah. uh, of the most random yeah. sort, then this is different. Of yes, all true. That's all true. That's all true. That's all true. That's all. But it's also that's also social. That's true. But uh, uh, yes, that's terms. true. But it also bring this uh, opportunity, or uh, okay. that you get, you can get people that don't answer the, the survey. Uh, if you, if I ask you, and some of, of, of your friends, they never answer a survey, <laughs> but you can estimate what that person will say. <laughs> so then we get information about that person uh, when we ask you. So that increases the information value of, 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 uh, that we can use to predict things. Okay, any more questions? No, actually, this is just predict. I mean, I just compare what you said. What will you vote for? Trump. Who will you vote for? Biden. Oh, and, then and then this is just a standard question in a survey for forecasting. That's all we're doing. We're just asking the standard questions about, uh, about uh, how people. If it was an election today, what will you vote for? Or actually, what is the percentage chance that you will vote for Biden? And then you ask you, what is the percentage <laughs> of your social circle that will vote for Biden? What is the percentage chance that the whole population in the U.S. will vote for Biden? These are the three questions that we have there. Okay, but yeah. I guess what you're saying is that, yeah, so if I'm not trying to get to, to the number of people I'm voting for, so what you're measuring is the effect of different kind of questions, like the forecasting power of different kinds of Yes. Right? So these are three different questions. Yeah. And, and uh, I mean, this election winner question has been used a lot, actually. 
I mean, yes, who will win the election? That's been used in the US in the early 20s, 30s, but not so much in the polling industry. They're still using the question, who will you vote for if was the uh, election today? No, no, but it's counterintuitive to look at that as an error. So I told you who I'm going to vote for, and then you measure that as an error compared to who actually wins. I mean, it's not an error. I vote for that person. But yeah, but the, the, error, but the error is just, I mean, it's just forecasting. We just yeah, take yeah. the average and we take, what is the outcome of the election? What is the prediction yeah. if I take the average? And what is the error? The yeah. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Yeah. 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 It's just, they understand, it has to do exactly the same as any server polling uh, thing. Yeah. No. But it's still on the same July. So if you go back then, yeah. Oh, well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is just a side point. I just wanted to show you this. So. Well, you are the guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. I no, I mean, one interesting thing is that I don't know how common it is and how robust it is, but it seems that uh, you predict better. I mean, when you try to predict mm. what happens at the national level, you copy yourself. You say that it's going to happen what you are going to do, so the blue is on top of the green, mm. rather than what your social circle is doing. So you see the nation as yourself rather than uh, your social circle. Okay. Is this something robust? No. Uh, so actually, this is so the error uh, lower is better. Uh, this is average no, absolute no, but, error. But, but yeah, you know, you uh, on top. So this is actually quite a typical. These two things. Uh, the 2018 and 2020. If you look back um, uh, throughout the, the um, polling history, and if you compare uh, this election winner uh, question, it's usually the error is usually lower than on intention. It's usually better than asking people about yourself. Not in these cases, but overall, it's actually the case that that asking about what the people, what you think, who you think will win the election, is actually usually better than just to ask everybody what, who they will vote for. Okay, let's let's move on. This is just I just wanted to show this that <laughs> we can actually use the information from the social circle to make forecasting uh, decisions. Okay, back to the the biased um, distributional assessment. So we see here there's there's some bias when you ask people about uh, characteristics in overall and broader populations. Um, so in order to understand why is this the case. Uh, we need to go into exactly how people are, are doing this um, estimation. So the first thing we can notice is that population estimates, which is on the bottom part of, of this uh, figure, uh, estimate the population distributions for household wealth, number of friends, and work stress. And we have separately plotted here these um, estimations or perceptions for worse off and better off people. And the same for estimated social circle distributions, for worse off and better off. First, we can just notice, oh, look, the population estimates follow the social circle estimates. But we also see that they are a little bit more flattened. You see, there's more peaky in the, the social circle distributions than the population distributions. So here is the, the, the key to that is that that can have many different causes. They've got statistical causes that, that um, uh, error in the way you, you, um, uh, you translate from your social circle distribution to population distribution. So error is going to flatten things. But what we think is happening here, and what we implement in our model is that people know, I mean, I know, in my social circle, uh, I know that my social circle is not representative of the population. So I try to kind of smooth that out a little bit uh, because I know that this is not the case. And one way of doing that is that you retrieve instances of people from your social circle, but you try not to retrieve those who are more similar to you, but those who are more dissimilar to you, which also then lead to this flattening of of your population distribution. So that is a mechanism that we, we implement in a, in a formal model of, of, uh, of uh, uh, population estimates. Okay. Multiple. Then we can then implement a, s a simple statistical version of this. It's an extremely simple. It's also called SSM there. It's basically just a a model that the kind of adjusts towards the average of all social circle estimates that makes it more smooth. 
It is a compared to what we call a regression account. It is just simply that, okay, let's take the, the actual population distribution uh, and add the same process of kind of smoothing it out, basically a regression account. And we see here that, that the, the um, our simple, extremely simple uh, account can then account for both worse off and better off people. It's just an uh, example. Okay, so now, wrong. Okay, so now we are in the position <laughs> to try to explain this conflicting results uh, that we uh, saw in the beginning. Okay, so we saw here that there's a difference in overestimation and underestimation of the lower and higher income category between these two. And we see that there's basically the same kind of measure, distributional measure. Um, but to note here is that to the right, the Page and Goldstein study, they used a national representative search. It's actually what we will expect uh, then due to this regression account and others that we would underestimate the lowest income category and overestimate the highest income category. But in the Chambers et al, they used a convenience sample for American Mechanical Turk, which then is not national representative. So what we can do here now, look, okay, what type of participants do we have here actually? So here we see the income distribution because they reported it to the supplemental materials. Uh, and we see that the, the participants' incomes is more severely skewed than the actual population income. And then the simple idea that, okay, if people base the judgment of populations from their social circle, we would find this that they owe. They will give a lot of, they will give a lot, a lot more in the under 35,000, they will give less in the 75,000 over. Even if they smooth a little bit, because this is quite, quite strong effects uh, in, in terms of their actual distribution. So even if it's smooth a little bit, we will still expect uh, that this pattern will hold. So it's important then to, to not just take the studies that they are, we need to know that where do the participants come from? How do they solve the task? So there's at least one contributing factor to this conflicting results for this uh, distributional measures. Okay, that was distributional measures. What about this ratio measures? That's been used a lot. Um, and and the, uh, more, the consistently, when you use this measure, you consistently find that uh, people are underestimating inequality. So for example, in 2012, uh, the estimated uh, ratio was 30 to one. This is also a national representative survey. When it was actually was 354 to one. Um, but then, what is this question? How do people uh, solve this question when they see this question? So when I see this question, okay, how am I supposed to, to solve this question? So is it a typical chairman? Is it any chairman, someone I know? Is it actually mean or median? It's unclear exactly how, what should you base this on? Uh, and, uh, and we don't know actually how people uh, solve this and, and we need more <laughs> research on exactly what's happening when people are getting this question. One little indication that it might not be so much about social circle in this question is that if you look at, for example, this study I cite there uh, from 2014, it's actually similar ratios across socioeconomic status, uh, which might suggest that there's actually less influence on social circles for this particular question, because different people from different parts of the distribution give similar ratios. So that's a little bit unclear how this ratio measures. I will come back to ratio measures a little bit later. Okay, then we have this ordinal measures. Um, so this shows uh, results from uh, Niehaus 2014. So you did, Niehaus did this uh, aggregate measure. Because we can think of, of uh, this is now from the US with different percentages that answer different things. So you can think of this that probably those who choose type A there, with a high concentration in the lower part, they are probably from the lower part of the distribution the uh, income, while those in type A probably, uh, based on the, what we discussed so far, are probably from the higher end. But if we combine all this somehow, then we should actually get a pretty good picture of, of the distribution, uh, uh, correspondence with the actual distribution and the, the kind of estimated distribution based on this measure. And that was also what uh, Judith Niehaus did here. So she kind of combined all this, like weighted or something. And what we see here, if we combine all this, we actually see that, that uh, uh, 
we see a little bit of underestimation of those categories. Pretty good agreement of the highest category overall. Mm, pretty good. Okay, that's all good and fine, but this is just one example. If you then look at the different countries, of course, we still see difference between countries, and that's been pointed out again and again. But again, what explains these differences? I mean, across countries, how do they interpret these different categories? Do they do that the same way across countries, across cultures, across different norms for different things? Still unclear if we can actually compare this across countries, and we, didn't, we don't know how people, different people and individual differences and cultural differences, how you interpret these different pictures. So, yeah, that's where we stand on, on this uh, measure. And of course, different samples of participants. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. True. We can still have uh, differences. I mean, what do you, perceptions of, 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 uh, of uh, like, what do you believe is this? Is this between zero and $20,000? Or is it between zero and $50,000? Or is it between zero and $200? Uh, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and it's a very, it's a very also, I mean, it's also a very crude measure. Uh, of this. Um, and then people, so, I mean, they use this measure for different things also. They use it for ideal type of societies. They show that that measure actually, that correlates pretty well with the uh, distributional, um, redistributional preferences, how you want an ideal society to look like, for example. But uh, I'm still skeptical about this measure because of, of I mean, we don't know how, how people actually interpret that and how, what they do in there. Okay. And of course, then we have this uh, question about uh, different wealth measures. Uh, so sometimes this can be very difficult for participants uh, or people in general to understand. You see, sometimes in instructions to people uh, explain different wealth measures like aggregated net worth across households. How do, do people know that? I don't, no, I don't think so. Um, so that can be one problem. Uh, another problem is, of course, if we now rely on, on, on our media social environment to make population uh, distributional judgments, of course, we have different visibility in different parts of society. We see different wealth in different uh, parts. We can have different social norms about sharing information about income or wealth. It's also, of course, going to influence how we um, make uh, uh, judgments about inequality. Okay, let me, what is the time actually? Okay, 10 plus one. So the obvious conclusion is that the <laughs> results of perceived inequality depend on the way it's measured. That's not necessarily bad because it's, it depends on what we are interested in also. Are we interested in, in the upper part and lower part of the distribution? Maybe the ratio measure could be good there. Are we interested in the whole distribution? Yeah, ask about the whole distribution. But don't expect them to, to coincide because this is going to interact with the type of process people are using to, to come to these estimates and the actual shape of distribution. <clears throat> and also, I hope I convinced you that estimates of inequality or, in general, uh, estimates of population characteristics depend on immediate social environment. And I think it's important to... Um, um, before we start relating measures of, uh, of inequality with like redistributed preferences, I think we need to kind of understand uh, how people actually are doing this judgment. Like what type of representations do they have of their immediate social environments? Or what are the processes that works on these representations? And finally then, how do these processes then interact with the structure of the immediate and broader environment? And then of course, on top of that, we have different ways of asking, which also interact with all these three other things. And, I mean, there's lots of open questions there, but let me ask a few things. Um, so when we ask about inequality, what are we exactly asking about? Are we asking about uh, inequality, or are we asking more about political preferences? So this ratio questions, for example, I, when I see these questions, I immediately start thinking about redistributed policies and so on. Like, oh yeah. But if I ask at the distribution, I might not think about that so much. I was like, oh, percentage here, percentage there. Then it's also not maybe, this is just as me speculating, maybe it's not surprising that it's actually shown that the ratio questions are pretty good uh, to, to um, pretty good predictors or they actually, at least they correlate with, with political preference like 
uh, redistributive uh, preferences. And they correlate, seem to correlate more than distribution questions. Although distribution question has not been used so much, so. But still, there's something to think about. And of course, like, we also, what part of the distribution are we interested in here? I mean, different questions target different parts of the distribution. So are we interested in the low part, high part, both of the low and high part, the difference between the low and the high part, the whole distribution of, of wealth, different groups of gender, race, et cetera. Different concentration of wealth in different parts there might trigger different beliefs about inequality. And then of course we have a bigger question, what are we asking about? Are we asking about the, are we interested in, in, in the local inequalities? Are we interna international between groups in the country? Are we interested in the global inequality? Because then all of this is different and might trigger different uh, uh, processes, there are different distributions involved and so on and so forth. Uh, and on top of that, we have the intergenerational inequality and all of that. And that was what I had to say. And Thank you. Thank you for a very inspiring talk. And mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so you talked a lot about uh, how people estimate uh, income and mm -hmm. so. Uh, uh, have you also studied how people perceive uh, the fairness, like uh, whether what they think, what distribution they would perceive as being fair or in inequal? No, we have not. There is a lot of studies on that, uh, uh, actually. So both in terms of, uh, especially when it comes to these uh, pictorial studies. So you ask both uh, to, to match it to your, your nation or society or whatever you ask about. But also, how do you think the society should be? Uh, and I don't know that literature 100%, uh, so I mean, just know that uh, uh, there is a lot of studies about that. Uh, but we have, we have not done that. So uh, I was just wondering, um, I mean, uh, is that, are there also studies that shows that how people perceive the dangers of climate change compared to what actually uh, the specialists know? Like how people are perceiving how bad things really are. So there are and, studies. And because I was also feeling that it might also depend to which part of the, uh, which part of the planet they're also living yeah. in. Right. Yes, definitely. So uh, I have not done that, but I know there are studies. But if you just extrapolate a little bit here, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, if it's important the immediate social environment, uh, it seems reasonable to suggest then that people, I don't know, those who uh, uh, in different parts of the world, a different weather, I'm using the weather or every day, or you hear about different catastrophes and so on and right. so forth, might be more inclined to, to maybe say that, uh, oh, this is a really important question. We, we need to address this. Uh, yeah. While I'm living in the northern part of Sweden, I'm not right. so concerned. But on average, how does it happen? I mean, when? on average, do people are really uh, they perceive the dangers well, or are they way off the mark? Uh, I think that uh, for I don't know for climate uh, okay. and estimates for the. Assets. I mean, there's also lots of uncertainties there. I mean, uh, uh, we have the ri uh, we know the risks, but uh, exactly. If you take a model outcome of the predictions of what's going to happen with the uh, average temperature in, in 200, 300 years, uh, there's also an uncertainty of that. So how do you compare it? Uh, to what are you going to compare the risks with, for example? But uh, I don't know that literature, but I know there are studies that, that uh, compare that. But uh, I, I cannot answer that okay. question. Okay. Maybe I can just talk later, yeah. just to get yeah. the reference. Yeah, yeah sure. Thank you. So I have a general question. Then. Um, so, my impression is that most of what you are talking about is about absolute perce perception or absolute wealth. Yes. Whereas my, uh, I, I read somewhere that uh, yep. we are better at perceiving relative wealth. So, like, you know, whether, say, yeah. you uh, earn, uh, say, 20% more or 20% less. Uh, or, so, what your wealth with respect to mine and uh, and somehow looks like I mean this um, I mean uh, idea of social circles 
maybe goes in this direction in the sense that we have a better perception of how we stand uh, in our... Well, yeah, so on the other hand, I mean... So or... my question is, yeah. would the questionnaires imp in improve if the question are asked in terms of relative wealth rather than absolute wealth. Yeah, so that's also a complicated question. So one thing is about, uh, in general, the, the relative thing. I mean, the ratio questions are a little bit like that, like you compare that. But they have other problems then, uh, because it seems that they are way off in terms of, of, of the relative difference between the high earners and the low earners. Um, um, and then we come, and then we come to, to this um, uh, question about the relative thing. So that's the thing with the relative standing uh, is going to involve so many other processes also. I mean, I am here in this position. And, okay, compare yourself to this uh, lawyer or, uh, over there, which might, in effect, trigger other processes, more biased processes. But if you just ask, as I said earlier, if you just ask about the distributions, uh, uh, and we show here that, that distributions uh, um, are actually quite accurate when you do the absolute percentages in different, in different categories. And, but when you start to include comparison processes, that might lead to different things. Having said that, we also have, <laughs> in our model, we also have uh, implemented uh, this kind of relative and, and uh, distribution judgments. And we, we can actually explain different say that we can explain different uh, effects of asking relative or absolute judgment uh, just because of the interaction between our, our processes and the distribution shapes of our social circles and the actual distribution shape but there's a bit too much to go into here but yes the, 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 I guess say that that uh, I in our experience asking for absolute judgments uh, or percentages in, in the distribution they're actually pretty good Although, uh, because of that they use their social circle estimates, you're going to see them a little bit flattened, a little bit of a kind of a regression effect on it. But actually, if you plotted it, the bias, I mean, when you read the literature on, on inequality and any distribution, you always see this, oh, they're way off. They're like, there's no, I mean, there's a totally, there are no correlations with objective reality whatsoever. That is not true. There is a correlation between them, and if you ask them for the distribution shape, they are pretty good. No, I'm wondering about for all these questions about absolute standards, since absolute is so kind of confusing and kind of mm. abstract, I'm wondering about using some other kind of circle type of question to ask people to compute the psychology of absolute standards. Um, so when you say psychology, what do you mean? So like, you know, like you said, something like when you want to have a way to actually compute some sort of attendance at a place, right? Mm -hmm. And so let's say pretend that you would like to make this thing. It's not that crazy of a big deal. Yes, no, but uh, that's an interesting question. I mean, uh, uh, that's something that uh, 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 definitely worth uh, pursuing because most in the social psychology literature about judgments of others is just individual persons. I mean, you say, like, what is the personality characteristics of Fariba? I ask, ah, you're high on this, you're, you're uh, outgoing, you're like, you know, a little bit neurotic, maybe. <laughs> so, no, no. And, uh, so that's, and then you compare, and then you ask, you answer the same questions, and then we see how this corresponds. And there's been lots of work on that, like, okay, we form impressions in the first 30 seconds, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but then, as you said, uh, asking then about the general population in, in similar sense, that would be actually quite, about the psychological processes more. That, that, So that's an interesting question. I, I mean, it's, there's lots of, of uh, uh, maybe I'll try to hint at uh, different things. So 
So if I get this question, uh, what, what would I do? I mean, first obvious thing is, that, oh, the, so the many sources of, uh, of information that you use uh, to, to uh, uh, answer that question, different processes of that. One is uh, obviously, oh, yesterday I read about this CEO on $30,000 only, okay. Mm -hmm. Then I base my judgment on that basically. Or I can just retrieve things from, from my memory or what, oh, I know this CEO, or I don't know a CEO, so I have to guess. So before I know that, we need to, to, uh, to know, or basically <coughs> to know what do, what do people know, what are the processes, uh, are the retrieval processes, or the inferential processes. Uh, so I think uh, making a, a state, blanket statement of people uh, do that is very much gonna be context dependent uh, based on your own experience, your social environment, the influence that uh, the uh, other sources of information like the social media or regular media has. So, yeah. Unfortunately, that's the only thing I can say at this point. Okay. Uh, just a quick one, I guess. So you talk about perception or misperception. So I was just wondering if you have insights about changes in perception, because so, I think present sustainability problems, so mm -hmm. perhaps we want to understand how people are changing perceptions. Um, so in that sense, we don't have the, for, for this regular distribution, and we have a little bit of that in when we have the forecasting thing. Then we can see like how, how do your own, uh, uh, your own beliefs of what, your own beliefs of what you will vote for and how that relates to your social circle, and we can see that over time how that changes. And we can then see, okay, what is influenced by political events? How does it change the beliefs over time? We see that we can see that from time series, and we can also use um, we can also have ideas about uh, how you influenced by the social environment. And maybe the social environment is a better predictor of what you will do in the future. So, for example, we can see some evidence that that. Um, uh, we asked people about the social uh, circle, uh, how they will vote, and how yourself will vote. And we can see that in some circumstances, actually, this, what you say that your social circle will vote is a better predictor of what you will vote for, what you're actually voting for. We seem to suggest then that there's this social influence that, okay, I'm not so sure about this, uh, maybe I'll go Biden, and then everybody around us say, uh, say like, Trump, 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 Trump. Okay, I will vote for Trump. So, so the, the social circle can be used as a crystal ball in some circumstances to understand changes in, in, in your beliefs and your behavior. So, so, yeah. Thank you. Um. Thank you.